Hello, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. And in today's presentation, I'd like to provide an analysis and interpretive approach to Nicholas Carr's Is Google Making Us Stupid? So let's observe. Um, Carr begins an essay with reference to uh, the film 2001 by director Stanley Kubrick. And he actually has, I, I want to argue that he, he, he defines his argument for the entire essay at the end where he states, as we come to rely on computers to mediate our understanding of the world, it is our own intelligence that flattens into artificial intelligence. This is quite interesting. Uh, but uh, upon careful interpretation, if you really think about it, um, whatever it is that we come to define as our own intelligence is actually truly nothing more than a, a reciprocation of uh, what, we're, what we're taking from uh, technological mediums, um, particularly the, the World Wide Web, so to speak. So uh, let's take a look and see uh, the relationship in which he demonstrates um, our, our flattening, the flattening of our own intelligence um, in relation to particular technologies that are out there. So again, he, he, he begins with uh, his first example, his first category, which I'll define in a little bit, but he begins with reference to, to the film 2001, which um, the antagonist comes to be this machine, this supercomputer. I mean, there's many possible antagonists, but you've got this supercomputer, Hal, as defined by Carr, uh, who expresses, Dave, stop, stop, will you stop, Dave? Will you stop, Dave? I mean, I do a lousy job of <laughs> replicating even a machine, but um, it's ironic to think that a machine actually has some of these feelings, right? Um, and and I think that that irony is purposeful. So I think Carr eventually is going to through the through the course of the essay is is trying to kind of say, look, we're, we're in a sense, we're almost no different than the machine itself. Uh, you know, here Hal saying, Dave, my mind is going. I can feel it. I can feel it. And, and then a car says, I can feel it too. Uh, and, and begins to describe this, this uncomfortable feeling that some essence of himself is being, you know, overtaken overtaken by, by someone else or something else. Uh, Broadly, okay. So, um, after that example, he he goes about and he provides this category. Now, I'm gonna. I mean, we can define the category in many different ways, but I think he he's referring to the category of literacy, in which we we include reading and writing. We'll look at writing in a little bit, but this this first category of reading, uh, it's interesting, and and he says. Okay, look, we've got these technologies, and, and of the technologies, you know, we can include computers and tablets, cell phones, and these are all devices and mediums in which we can immediately access a book, an article, a, a, a newspaper, uh, you know, a, a comic strip. Uh, Whatever, whatever the, the, the medium, right? Um, that medium is further uh, converted into a new medium. So the physicality of the book is is now you know I can use an Amazon Kindle as illustrated here, a magazine, you know through the Kindle, anything through the Kindle. Well, gosh, that's great, right? You know, books are bulky and possibly heavy, not as manageable. So what's the problem? And 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 Carr very well says he says absolutely you know there's an efficiency and immediacy in which I can acquire this book, read this book, read this article, read this newspaper, read this whatever it is. 
However, you know, despite all of this, I don't quite self feel myself invested. I am disengaged. Um, so let's think about it, right? If I'm reading a physical book and I'm going through the process of reading, physically reading a book, the argument is that I'm, I'm invested within the book, right? Um, why? Could it be maybe because I'm entirely focused that there's no, there's no sense of disruption in the course of reading this physical resource, as opposed to maybe, you know, if you think about reading on a, on a, on a cell phone or reading on a computer, what am I doing by reading on a cell phone or a computer or some of these other mediums? Well, you know, there's, there, I am but a click away of um, driving my mind somewhere else. Right. And, and, and so then Carr illustrates and he expressly says, gosh, you know, I used to be able to read long stretches of prose and now I can't do that anymore. Now my mind is kind of like it's it's in that same token of kind of like the the, the efficiency of a machine, the immediacy of a machine. I'm, um, um, my my attention span is is distorted, so to speak. Well, he follows this up with another category, and the second category is is composing and writing. And it doesn't necessarily have to be writing. It could also be the the, the composing of a of a of a you know an artist being an artist or a music score or what have you. But generally, the the focus here is of course of writing. And and he refers to a a um, an iconic philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, you know, very well known. And just a quick history of of Nietzsche. He he eventually went blind. You know, he acquired a disease that. You know, uh, uh, syphilis, I believe, I think was, <laughs> you know, the disease that he acquired, unfortunately, that led him to uh, ultimately go blind, so to speak. Uh, so now Nietzsche used to compose, you know, and, and you think about philosophers or writers, you know, in early eras, uh, and, and you read their stuff, and it's, it's, uh, it's very reflective, right? Very reflective and expansive, and 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 uh, there's a romantic feel to it. Even even if written with a the technicality of science or philosophy or, or politics, you know, what have you, whatever the issue. Well, Nietzsche going blind, he couldn't write anymore. Well, at least his his ability to compose ultimately became lost. But then he was introduced to a machine, you know, a type of typewriter, um, and 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 you know, for us today, it's the it's the computer, right? But uh, thinking of Nietzsche, right? Thinking of Nietzsche, and for him, here's this new technology, um, you know, this 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 typewriter, so to speak. Um, what is this machine doing for him? Well, you could argue that the machine, in this case, what Carr labels a Malling Hansen writing ball, literally a ball. If you look at it, it's it's not like a you know the the type of typewriter that typewriter that we're used to. Uh, this machine's supposed to be a, a godsend, isn't it? Well, uh, the 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 German media scholar Kittner he says. Under the sway of the machine, Nietzsche's prose changed from arguments to aphorisms, from thoughts to puns, from rhetoric to telegram, telegram style. So again, if you think about somebody composing via a pen in hand, where we were immediately invested in the, in the, in the, um, you know the, the that pen in my hand whatever i put down on paper any mistake is is immediately on me and and i'm back to a certain extent i'm back to the drawing board 
I don't have the luxury of kind of like with the computer where we can just delete and fix uh, immediately, right? You know, um, um, what's lost? You know, is, it could it be that you know the sense of our of our argument, as as Kittler points out here with regards to Nietzsche. Whatever it is I'm arguing, my argument is is my the personal my, the personal investment in that argument is is that lost, right? A, a, am I no longer invested in? I mean, obviously I am invested, but maybe I'm doing it a little bit more banally, superficially, on the surface sort of things. Okay. The next example, and I, here I labeled it artistry and uniqueness, but I could have very well labeled it our humanities to a certain extent loss. Uh, and this is with regards to, to other technological resources. Uh, one of the primary ones mentioned by Carr is the clock. Um, certainly a, a, a technology that to this day is... is um, essential for many of us. I mean, the clock, you know, in the in that ironic tone, the, talk, the clock's almost that driving tone for, for many of us. Sociologist Daniel Bell has called our intellectual technologies the tools that extend our, ment our mental rather than our physical capacities. We inevitably begin to take on the qualities of those technologies. It's interesting, right? We're we're becoming the clock, we're becoming the computer, we're becoming whatever technology it is that we're undertaking. He says, in deciding when to eat, to work, to sleep, to rise, we stopped listening to our senses and started obeying the clock. So to illustrate this, this commentary here, uh, he has the example of Friedrich Winslow Taylor who steps into the Midvale steel plant. And and, and I guess I can I can, um, rewind a little bit here and if you think of, let's think of a worker creating something minus the clock maybe there's no sense of stress no sense of urgency and I, I you know I it's my job so I've got to create something does logic maybe tell us and again this is argumentative right but does logic maybe tell us that without that urgency of the clock tick, tick, ticking away at us. I'm going to create something a little bit more beautiful. I mean, think about things, maybe not efficient, but thinks about, think about things maybe created from the 1800s, maybe early 1900s, mid-1900s. The craftsmanship, you could argue, is a little bit more sturdy, wasn't it? Uh, there's a type of beauty to it. That's not to say that we don't have beautiful creations today. But, you know, um, humor me a little bit here, right? That some of these tools and resources have a type of artistic design, craftsmanship, personalization to them that today, you know, the scope of mass production is not as evident anymore. Another example, he, he refers to uh, uh, Plato slash Socrates, uh, a text, uh, a piece called Phaedrus, <clears throat> in which Socrates was arguing that um, um, writing, writing was going to strip, strip us of our ability to remember things. And, and, you know, when you think by logic again, if we've written things down, we're depending on the written word rather than our own memories then yeah, there's no denying that our, our memory banks might be a little bit more frail and, and, and affected by the matter. So, so there you have it. We have an interesting essay in which very much our, our sense of intelligence is flattened and by the categories that Carr provides here in terms of reading, writing, and our, our humanity, right? our artistry, our unique creation of things. I, I hope this has helped you. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. And thank you. Thank you for listening.